So today we are hosting our new event on the impact of COVID-19 on the global tech. And today we have three parts in our today's session. We'll start with a panel discussion, uh, how the COVID-19 pandemic influences the industries where people travel less and meet online, work remotely, switch to ad tech, changing many industries paradigms in a new reality. And today I have um, the following investors in our panel. It's um, Team Anakin, uh, Managing Director and, and in, at the Digital Capital Management. Also Ben Jen, CEO and Angel Investor at Ben Jen Holdings. That's how we see founder and um, chairwoman at Test Ventures. Ashton Edison, new broadcasters and um, interview host at Reuters Canada. And Nick Ayton, Family Office Advisor, Futurist, Quantum computer, uh, Computing Global Keynote. And afterwards, we will go to the pitch competition. We'll have pro four projects today uh, who will also um, challenge and compete at the uh, elevator pitch in front of the investors, followed by a Q&A. So I'll start our today's discussion with our panelists and first give the floor to each of them for a short introduction. Hello, Nick Ayton. Please introduce yourself and uh, tell us a bit on your company. Hi, um, so I am a technologist. I've been around since the 70s. I own a number of businesses, including a crypto exchange, in, indeed. Um, I'm making a TV miniseries about artificial intelligence as well. And I spend a lot of time helping founders perfect and polish their propositions and raise capital from not only family offices, but also the big tech funds. So I've been in tech for over 40 years, maybe 45 years, and uh, I generate quite a lot of deal flow on both sides, both buy and sell. The, the question that uh, we've been posed is interesting because, you know, we, this is, we have pandemics, we have global crisis, and in my view, this is a, a quite a useful, although it's bad, I should say, of course, but I think this is quite a useful rehearsal for what is, what is probably going to happen in not too uh, distant future when quantum computing meets artificial intelligence. I think uh, it's going to catch us, it's going to blindside us and catch us all unawares. But the direct question is, you know, around this pandemic. Well, my perspective, uh, just for uh, spending a minute on this, is that the plans that we had don't work. The plans that we think we had don't work. The nature of work, the nature of how organizations have been affected is fundamentally shifted. So we've gone from 100% of the people, maybe 95% of the people, sitting inside the safe infrastructure of the organization, the enterprise, to now most of those people sitting outside of the enterprise in an infrastructure that is completely in inadequate. So the first thing you have to do with commerce when we're all doing remotely, we're all on Zoom, and I hope you're buying your Zoom share price, your shares, because the price is looking good. But the first thing that happens, of course, is, is that we're all working remotely. So the first problem we have is identifying who is at the end of that conversation, who is at the end of that transaction, who is out there. Uh, is it somebody impersonating somebody? How do you identify 100% who that person is? So that's the first question. The second question is having identified and validated the identity of the individual, ideally biometrically, how do you get information, decisions, transactions agreed and approved? Because technically you may not have a center, the C-level suite, the management team, the people making the decisions will be disparate. So the question remains is how do you get a transaction? How do you get things done? and validated and what is the workflow and what is the sign-off process for getting business and commerce done given where we are so those are the two fundamental questions that i want to i have some ideas and answers by the way but those are some of the positions i would uh, i would put out there in terms of how this pandemic is affecting commerce uh, and what we have to think about Thank you, Nick. Uh, ben Jen, uh, would you add uh, on the new working behaviors and impact of security? 
Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, could you uh, also comment on uh, Nick's uh, uh, two questions which he mentioned and um, also the changing of uh, working behaviors and impact on security? Um, on the impact of security, okay. Um, I, sorry, I am not used to um, attending a, a live event. <laughs> um, so uh, I think from the impact of security perspective, um, I definitely think that, um, um, sorry, uh, to reiterate your question was regarding the impact of security that rem remote workers have or um, that? Uh, yes, so lots of um, industries are changing paradigms and uh, most people, they also go to um, uh, remote education at tech, right? Sure. and uh, changing patterns uh, in all the different other segments. And Nick also mentioned a couple of questions uh, which he finds vital um, for today in the impact of the current uh, pandemic period. Um, would you also briefly introduce yourself for oh, our, right. our larger sure. audiences and uh, just uh, uh, highlight the key issues you find important in the uh, current situation? Of course. Uh, so my name is Ben. I am uh, New York City based. Um, I uh, am an investor in, um, in, I'm very industry agnostic with my investments. Uh, I do invest in earlier stage startups, um, typically from pre-seed C to series A. Um, I do some secondary investments, but uh, mostly in uh, early stage uh, tech startups. Um, so regarding Nick's question, um, I think that, um, well, in, in regards to your question as well, um, regarding the impact on, on ed tech. Um, so I work with a lot of uh, younger uh, people in high school and, and in college as well. Um, and definitely um, a lot of schools were not prepared for the shift to, um, you know, online and remote education. So um, I think it's a, it's a mix of um, having um, the right infrastructure as well, because um, a lot of um, sc schools in more rural areas aren't set up um, as well. Um, but uh, a lot of a lot of schools have shifted to using Zoom, shifted to using um, Blackboard, um, shifted to using a lot of uh, you know online learning management platforms or Google Classroom for that matter um, in a relatively short period of time and. Um, I mean, you can definitely tell that there are some schools that are able to get uh, a lot of the curriculum online. And um, a lot of people were able to um, shift some of their, um, their, shift a lot of the, um, yeah, they were able to shift a lot of the classes online and, and shift a lot of the, uh, the uh, uh the classwork online as well um sorry i'm not speaking that well today um and a, a lot and you know in, in in just like employers employers are struggling with with distance with with distance tech uh, uh, just like schools because a lot of the employers um they they've haven't necessarily ad adapted or they weren't created uh, uh to have as many of their employees work uh, re remotely. Um, a lot of um, employers are, are set up to have off uh, office workers come in and work. Um, but, you know, with the emergence of tech like Slack, um, you know, Zoom and uh, a lot of different conferencing platforms and, um, you know, Microsoft Teams, it's definitely ma made things a little bit easier, but, um, you know, it's still no real substitute, I guess, for having people come in and work in person. Thank you so much, Ben. And um, Team Anakin, would you like to address a couple of um, issues you find important as well? And uh, starting with a brief introduction. Thank you. Uh, briefly, I uh, was a longstanding fiat investor running investment funds and got invited to start or to manage an investment fund in, in the crypto space in 2013, which was uh, supposedly the first crypto fund in history. Did that for a while, learned about uh, Bitcoin. Initially, I thought it was the dumbest thing I'd ever heard of. Uh, did a lot of research into things like tulips and other stuff and decided, okay, maybe it's not so stupid. 
I was had a fun focus on Eastern on Eastern Europe. И там, когда я там занимался, я жил в Москве долго. Um, sorry about that. And uh, decided to shut that fund down because I didn't like the direction Russia was taking. This is before Ukraine and everything. So I got out at the last good time. And rather than shutting my fund down, I converted it into a crypto trading fund. So I st thereby starting what is supposedly the first crypto trading fund uh, in history. So that's my crypto background. My non-crypto background, I'm actually uh, the asset manager for a medium-sized Southern California trust and family office, which does no crypto. So I have very strongly one foot in the crypto camp and one foot in the non-crypto camp. In answer your, to you, the, some of the previous issues, I'm going to be a bit provocative. Uh, I don't think that fundamentally much is going to change at all. The, the human, human beings have an amazingly short memory. Uh, generally, that's a survival trait, so it's a good thing. But there's, there's no fundamental shift that's going to happen here. The world will, uh, will rubber band back in basically to where it was before. Uh, there's no reason to, in, in the vast majority of in, industries to change anything because this was a highly unusual event. Uh, hopefully, we'll have better medical responses put into place should something like this occur again. But to me, it's absolutely nonsensical to do uh, massive rearranging, either in terms of organization, in terms of workflow, in terms of uh, infrastructure for something that maybe is not a, a complete black swan event, but is certainly close to that. Uh, so the, uh, the last thing I'll say is I've, I had an interesting observation in terms of what markets do when, during a crisis. And I'd love to hear people's reaction to this. I've run this off my team and it seems to work. And that is when a crisis happens, let me back up. When there is no crisis, markets look out six to 12 months. Fiat markets do that. Crypto markets have a shorter time horizon, but they're looking out whatever period there is that is in a normal, under normal circumstances. In a crisis, and I haven't seen this written any place, so I'm, but I'm not sure it's an idea unique to me. There are very, very few unique ideas out there. But when a crisis happens, the vision gets shorter. So what you saw three weeks ago, for instance, in fiat markets, is that the markets were looking about a week or 10 days out. I mean, their vision went from whatever it is, right, 12 months down to a very, very short period of time, probably weeks, maybe even days for a little while while the panic, the panic set in. And I'm talking more equities markets than bond markets, although the same thing happened to a lesser degree on bond markets. And then as soon as there's any light on the, at the end of the tunnel, vision starts to go out again. So this weekend was a fascinating illustration of that. First of all, you had these big recut, you have big drops on Monday because people were three Mondays in a row because people were absorbing weekend news. And this is true in the fiat market and the crypto market too, because suddenly crypto and fiat markets correlate almost to 100%. Uh, never happened before. Everyone's getting short. They're reacting to Monday. Monday it plunges. They start actually thinking with their forebrain instead of their hindbrain come Tuesday morning and the markets shoot back up again. They recover almost everything they recovered. Crypto markets included, although the recoveries were less, were less correlated. And now over this past weekend was fascinating. You had lots of bad news. We had a million on Thursday, a million cases. Uh, initially over the weekend, you have Spain, Italy, uh, the UK, and the United States all setting records for both cases and deaths. And then suddenly, Mayor Cuomo, who's, who's become, if, if this had happened six months ago, he'd be the Democratic nominee for president in the United States. Suddenly over the weekend, you have hitting, you have various countries hitting the top or getting closer to the top of the wave, at least the number of cases on Saturday, Sunday, and this morning, uh, this morning in the US. So uh, during the day already in, the, in, the, in Europe, where most of you are, I understand it, there, there's a decrease. It's still in, it's, there's still more cases, but it's not as many more as it was the day before, yesterday or the day before. So it looks like we're starting to arch over and there's some great charts that illustrate this better than my, my lame words, pardon me. And so what you end up with is that happens on Sunday and suddenly the markets are looking out, oh, it's over. So the vision of the markets has gone out from a couple of days. And if we're focused on a short period of time, you're looking at Boris Johnson 
being hospitalized in, in the UK. He's the first and only head of state that's actually been hospitalized because of coronavirus. They'd be focusing on that. But because they now see light at the end of the tunnel, the focus is moving back out again. And to summarize, go back to what I initially said, I don't view this as a, what they call a secular change, a fundamental shift. This is a, an issue, a crisis that the world is working through. And if we prepare for the last crisis, we're not gonna be ready for the next one anyway. There's no reason to fundamentally change how the world works here. And the last comment I would say is, given where we're all located, we'd be on Zoom anyway. Coronavirus has nothing to do with a lot of the remote communication. In my team, my office, virtually nothing has changed. And for most people, uh, at certain levels, that's what it's going to be. And when the world winds up again, we're going to see a Q3 and a Q4 that are going to blow away uh, what's, uh, what anyone expected to happen in those quarters. So a little bit controversial, perhaps, said a little bit more categorically than uh, that I might normally say for the sake of discussion, but uh, I, I firmly believe the general theses that I just outlined. Okay, great team. Thank you for the fundamental note and the observations. And uh, Ashton, would you share your views? How do you see the situation? Do you see anything controversial as team did? Or what are your views on the current state of things? Thank you so much, Nadia. Let me start with a brief introduction of myself involved in the blockchain industry, uh, specifically in events, which have had a major shift so far. Uh, in 2017, I started Event Chain, which is a blockchain secured event ticketing platform, uh, looking to solve the counterfeiting issues and, and manage ticket scalping on the secondary market using smart contracts. Uh, prior to that, I had started uh, the Crypto Coin Show, which is a media platform uh, which gives a, a platform for startups and uh, crypto companies to showcase their technology. Uh, and my YouTube channel, Crypto Coin Show, has about 500 different interviews on it right now, uh, ranging from all different industries. Um, and just to highlight into the event industry so far, and specifically in Europe, where you know, travel between countries is so easy, and there's so many conferences going on. You know, Tim mentioned that he believes you know everything will go back to normal. Um, but I, I it, you know, when this crisis is over, but I, I foresee that definitely um, there will be a, a question in the back of, you know, event organizers' minds specifically is, you know, how many events should we move some of our events into virtual events and, and keep them there? And I think because it, it, it was a growing trend, but now with everyone forced to move into virtual events, I can foresee some companies, uh, you know, still they really, a lot of people really want those in-person events and they're very hard to replicate uh, that experience of being face-to-face -face on a networking floor or um, seeing somebody pitch live and seeing the body language that they have, uh, you know, often speaks more than uh, being able to see them through a Zoom. Uh, but I've, I do see that many companies uh, will see the cost savings of uh, the reduced expenses for travel, um, and even just with working for commuting, uh, a lot of companies that were forced to go online, uh, when the company owners see uh, the, the cost savings, if they once they can ramp their revenue back up, uh, when we're back in you know great economic times, they might want to keep that cost savings of uh, some of the overhead that they had, where you know maybe not all team meetings need to be meetings. Maybe some meetings can be calls. And you know maybe some calls can be emails, and I think <clears throat> the increase of this Zoom technology uh, is definitely going to uh, affect some companies in, in in the long term. You know, some might decide that uh, their weekly meetings have now turned into Zoom calls, and that saves time and money um, on that side. I think uh, for event organizers that are uh, doing virtual events, um, they. they they definitely need to make sure that people are still uh, interacting and uh, engaged in the events. You know, it can be hard to replicate uh, when people also have you know five screens in front of them, and and they have easily have the ability to minimize the, the Zoom window and turn down the volume. You know, the commitment to going to events uh, with the, all the distractions here may uh, may make it a little harder. 
but I think that uh, at least Zoom so far, you know, as Nick said, Zoom's, Zoom is doing incredible. They're at $45 billion valuation practically right now. Um, and with the breakout rooms and being able to do networking, I think part of that will definitely stay. Uh, and at the same time, I think it's great to look at uh, com competitors to Zoom uh, for virtual working because there are other companies uh, that have you know, a 10 times smaller valuation, which could uh, easily grow to that of Zoom as well. Um, and I think throughout Europe, a lot of people will be using this software. Um, and at the same time, I know he touched at the very beginning on security and I think on privacy as well, is good to note that with the increased use of technology uh, to, for communication and we're not in communicating in person, you know, everything is being recorded uh, on the internet, through your phone, through your messages, and it doesn't come without privacy concerns as well. You know, I know Zoom's had a little bit of uh, scrutiny for uh, their technology, and now that every school, every meeting, every event is on Zoom, uh, it's good to know that, you know, it's, you should consider that everything you say is, isn't private anymore because there's always technology that's recording and you know this event is going to be up on the internet for, for all time to see. And as long as people are conscious of that um, and they're okay with that, then that's good. I think it's just great to have people on the same level uh, of understanding. Um, so, Hey Ashton, don't you think most of those trends were happening anyway? I definitely think that they were happening anyway. Um, and this is sort of like just the trigger that forced everybody to move into that uh, area, uh, but it definitely accelerated it, right? And it, it could be for the, for the better um, if people can maintain their efficiency and engagement, but uh, increase um, the savings and, and, and have more time. I, I, I think that, um, it, it, again, it's hard to replicate, you know, for example, a school environment online uh, because kids' attention span all of a sudden goes out the window when they have, when they're at home. Um, but but it's it could be for the better, uh, and it definitely saving all of us, I know, the time and money to, to fly, uh, you know, across continents to go to events, but at the same time, people want that, and I'm hoping that there are still great events, but there may be more great events, but also more virtual events where people can get information that they couldn't get before. Uh, thank you, Ashton. And Tass, would you comment on so on the shifts on the human behavior during this pandemic days? What do you find as an observation? Maybe you could share that as well with a brief introduction on yourself, Tass. Hi. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Can you turn on your camera as well um, so that we could see you? Yes. I, sorry about that. Uh, Nick, would you like to comment something uh, in between while test, uh, test is uh, getting in contact with us? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, it's very interesting, isn't it, that, um, you know, we've spoken a lot about Zoom, this platform, um, which is fundamentally, you know, not secure. And uh, it's possible to, you know, assume somebody else's identity. Do we really know you're there? You know, it's that kind of thing. And, um, and it's not secure communications. And the internet wasn't designed to be secure anyway. And, and, and my, uh, my observations are really that, um, you know, I think, I think uh, Tim's right. I think, you know, it's, it probably is a momentum that's already been taking place where people are moving to remote platforms. But the, 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 that doesn't mean to say it's the right direction. It doesn't mean to say it works correctly because it doesn't. And um, if you look further out, as I said before, um, this virus is, is not going to change much at all. It will disrupt industries and it will, you know, the weak ones will fail, survival of the fittest and all of that, which is not necessarily a good thing from a human point of view. Um, but I think generally speaking, you know, the, the biggest the biggest concern that I have is, is, 
is what lies ahead and it's the malware viruses it's the next generation of sandworm it's the nopetia virus you know it's it will have what happens next when it's quantum enabled and this will that will make this look like a tea party just a few thoughts perfect thank you so much nick and tas uh, <coughs> would you comment uh, on the maybe some observation on the human behavior what could this pandemic um bring us to in terms of circumstances and maybe the impact on that. Thank you. With a brief intro, yeah, on yourself. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you for um, everyone's time. So I'm Tess, uh, Tess Venture. Um, this is a venture that I founded and started. Um, the key uh, background that um, I think is relevant um, when investors help and identify uh, great startups and great technology is um, an operating background as a founder. So I was very fortunate that I was able to identify a startup that I wanted to do uh, very early in the undergrad and was able to gain the experience throughout that process of going through university and then ultimately um, was being able to have um, a good exit. Uh, that led me to my path to Silicon Valley, where I spent some time at Stanford, two years there, and focusing on cultivating relationships that allowed me to be mentored by some of the top VCs and also a lot of the great ecosystem there. So with that said, I wanted to have the combination to pay it forward for other startups and was able to really invest actively and be proactive in helping accelerate the startups and the founders journey uh, throughout the growth process. Um, very early stage is what I focus on and be able to help them throughout um, their growth cycle in terms of securing true uh, clients and also down the road, next round of funding through great intros to global investor sets, institutional funding, family office to angels. And then sometimes with acquisitions, I would love to be able to facilitate that and have done that. So having said that, I identified in this um, unfortunate situation of this global pandemic, where I had the uh, early insight because of um, a lot of my Chinese friends back in December and January. So that gave me a head start into looking at what potentially the startups and founders that was in my ecosystem of what I said, maybe they should already start identifying and transitioning, which obviously was a lot of remote distributed um, work. And combined with that is my background in blockchain and cryptocurrency the last four years. So having said that relationship and people was fundamental to what my belief was and I always have shared that people is the first component and the majority of what makes a company. That's why relationship was something between friends, between peers, between startup co-founders was already identified and valued in my circle. So that led us to a lot of the um, being able to access the health and the mental health of uh, team members. So I've already shared that uh, a lot of my fortunate Stanford friends had already started health startups um, that focus on mental health. And in this anxiety period, that definitely was highly utilized by various people accessing various uh, mental health startups. And that also led to obviously, you know, legal tech startups uh, a rise in that. And also obviously in this case, what makes a person happy is their personal life, um, which is relationship management of their also their own personal life. So a founder's relationship in my due diligence process was always a component that it was ideal if they had a um, supportive other half whether that is uh, a relationship they're in or a marriage. And that's something that I ask um, founders to always think about and how to make sure they have a good balance. That's why uh, various startups right now have been popping up that have been focusing more on legal tech startups and also on um, mental health. And of course, on relationship, which that process is making the relationship better or really identifying where there's problems there, they should really fix it, which means stay together or speak candidly, authentically about it and transition gracefully. So I definitely do see the rise of divorce startups happening because there are some um, startups that actually can help manage that process remotely, educate it 
and in a more less disruptive way of the traditional model where a lot of the um, divorce lawyers who don't manage it well, you know, actually take advantage of that very sensitive period. And I think to be a successful founder, all of that component is important. Um, and on my venture capital friends uh, side, we have seen definitely a lot more, um, I would say, you know, uh, deal flow and startups and entrepreneurs that either have pivoted or they have launched the startups that they always have wanted to. So in the last one month, Globally, I have seen um, various startups um, that have already asked for advice or asked for, you know, funding that related to this aspect. And largely, a lot of my um, Stanford friends actually have started startups in mental health and some focusing on relationship management. Um, they've partnered up with Stanford professors and have been already um, having a good um, database of um, definitely startup individuals that understand technology can be used to achieve that gap and hopefully having the access of you know our cell phone in our back pocket actually does make it more um, easier for them to access help when they do feel that anxiety or that frustration in the relationship or in the you know in the actual um, you know environment and market which actually is a lot easier than the traditional model of accessing a you know, couple relationship management uh, individual or a marriage counselor that you have to book and plan ahead. So I really believe that technology enables relationships and also the, um, for sure, the marriage component to be better. And that is truly just having couples that are now isolated in this period where they're forced to really identify these situations or if they don't and they continue to keep that pressure on it eventually will blow up so that's why unfortunately with coronavirus and this forced isolation uh, which is needed for society to be safer and to hopefully you know um, make the world you know a, a lot safer they are forced to actually identify and look at these uh, situations carefully and I definitely would recommend that uh, with this extended period of FaceTime families, couples, relationships should really utilize these um, remote um, access online services so that they can really go through and evaluate how they can for sure uh, increase uh, the um, best practice of the relationship in terms of, you know, um, really having a balance and look and maybe how these professionals guide them through that process using some of these startups. I personally do believe there's huge benefit in it. And unfortunately, the rise of divorce may happen because sometimes in this isolation, this pressure where they emotionally probably are not ready for a divorce, but they actually do want it. And they just do it yourself, go online, or they say things that they don't mean. So unfortunately, you know, that will happen. However, the divorce market, actually the addressable market is about, you know, $50 billion market or 60 billion even. And it is clear that you know society may have to have to redefine marriage first so that um, individuals can actually not fall into the structure of what the traditional concept of marriage and divorce is. So I think a lot of these startups is going to help guide us through all of this. So that's how I feel um, we can see the benefits and some of the um, negatives and costs and benefits of what will happen in this forced isolation period. Okay, thank you very much, Tess. So, Tim, what would be your conclusion out of the whole spread of today's views and uh, some of the maybe considered contradictory or fundamental and Tess also address some human nature response to the current pandemic uh, closing up in home offices for all? So, what would be your final conclusion? Well, I'm not a divorce, I'm not a divorce lawyer or, uh, and, and I'm not a marriage counselor, so I'll I'll stay away from I'll stay away from that. Personally, I love spending more time with my family. It's been awesome. Uh, the uh, my overall conclusion is is essentially what I what I said before, uh, and probably is reflected best in the question I asked Ashton, because the the tr some of the trends. The only thing. Let me back up a second. Sorry. The only real impact, lasting impact, and one could argue whether it's much of an impact at all that the coronavirus is going to have, or rather the reaction to the coronavirus is going to have, is to accelerate certain trends that were taking place already. 
take a look at employment, right? The retail is getting decimated. Well, <laughs> retail's been getting decimated for the last, last six years, right? Who's hiring? Uh, Amazon is hiring 100,000. I'm sorry to be US centric here, but the numbers are more dramatic in the US, partly because it's a large, the largest economy in the world and partly because it's integrated. The EU is bigger, but it's not nearly as well integrated. So Amazon hires 100,000, CVS hires 50,000. Uh, who else is hiring? Uh, Walmart is hiring 50,000. So you're seeing 200,000 workers in the, place of a, in the space of a month going away from certain pieces of the economy where gig meets the road, let's say, pun intended with Lyft and Uber, to the more online centric uh, business models. In terms of cutting costs and other things that Ashton, for instance, referred to happening already. Uh, does it heighten certain concerns like Nick referred to? Absolutely. If we're, to more, if we're more dependent on remote working, then security places, a, uh, security is, should have a higher premium placed on it. You have Zoom bombing now, which comes out of the blue, right? Which is why we had to log in with uh, an access code on, on, on Zoom. But I'm sorry, security is always a wrestling match, right? Hackers come up with another way of doing something, then there's another defense. And it's just like wrestling, move, counter move, move, counter move. That was going on before. The, so I really don't see a lasting effect of this uh, there other than accelerating certain trends that were taking place already. Uh, thank you so much, team. And we go to our second um, panel, which would be represented by our startup companies. And um, the first uh, elevator pitch uh, is uh, from Stanislav uh, Zvyshinsky, CEO and co-founder of Comtrade. Are you ready, Stanislav? Yeah, yeah, hi. Okay, so go ahead. You have five minutes. Okay, just a second. I share presentation. Just a second. Do you see it? Yes, perfectly. Okay. You can cool. go ahead with a full screen mode and with a brief introduction. Okay. Uh, so, uh, hi, we are Comtrade and we are already save a lot of money for per month for plastic trader. My name is Tas, I'm co founder of Comtrade. And we are B2B software for all material traders. It takes seconds to buy a simple thing like a pen, but to produce it and produce many other plastic things around us, companies need to buy and deliver polymers and spend over 40 hours of employees' work time on this process every day. Why? Because the deals and shipments of raw material process are a mess. We came from polymer trading industry. How this process look like in our company how this process look like in company of our colleagues and in other 30k US polymers traders. When we had to buy and deliver polymers uh, to manufacturing, we had to grab the phone, open Excel tables, send tons of documents by emails and go to meetings. This is how traders are doing business and this is ineffective for us and for our colleagues. We tired of it and we created Comtrade such solution that cuts over 25% of employees in effective work time by after making automating tracking and streamline workflows between the contractors. We calculate that it saves over $1,000 per deal and average trading company on the market makes over 50 deals monthly. So we can provide monthly savings over 50,000 for each company. For this, we charge $1K in monthly subscription for a basic product and we, go, and we will go deeply in automation of the business. It's cheaper than big enterprise CRM systems and our product is specifically designed for the polymer trading industry. There are some specific of the polymers. The market is very huge, but it is very interconnected. We go to the market through our network and affiliate partnership program because our solution fully works between the contractors. Now, after New York acceleration program, uh, we are finalizing a pilot with Plastic Trader and in the next uh, few months, we will onboard customers from ready pipeline of companies. We are looking for pre-seed round uh, of $100K for finishing seven more pilots in target market and reach over 75K annual revenue. Then in the next autumn, we will go on seed round. 
We are targeting on a, on a distributed ecosystem of fully automated raw material trading process. With this core technology, we can go to another related market of commodities like oil products, metals, and grains. And also we can launch marketplace for our clients. With this product, our exit strategy is acquiring by big enterprise software or we can be a public offering. My partner owns a commodity trading company and has a Morgan Stanley background and market network. My experience is IT management in big technological company and launching startup. We engaged a strong advisory board of experienced commodity players from US, Russian and global markets. So thank you very much. My name is Tas, I'm co-founder of Comtrade and welcome on board of Hustle Technologies for Commodity Hustlers. Uh, thank you, Stanislav. And um, DRO, uh, the judges and investors, keep your Q&A uh, ready after okay. we hear all the projects. And our okay. next project is Giorgio Guidetti, uh, CTO and founder of Habits. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So, um, yes, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Giorgio Guidetti, and I'm the CTO and founder of Habits. And Habits is the world's first augmented reality fashion commerce powered by blockchain. So the idea underlying Habits was born in late 2017 when it was announced on the WWDC stage that the next years would have been focused on the augmented reality. Uh, in that moment, we realized that AR technology could have been applied with tremendous advantages to the fashion industry. Uh, in the meantime, the blockchain technology was disrupting industry and we understood that with a combination of the two, we could craft a solution to solve the fashion industry main issues. But what are the three main problems which are preventing the fashion industry to grow even further? To us, they are sluggish conversion rates, rising customer acquisition costs, and too many expensive returns. So what is Habits? Uh, Habits, how does it solve these problems? Thanks to our application for uh, uh, trying fashion accessories, our smart mirror, for trying apparel and our admin panel for managing your presence on the Habits fashion store. So let's go through them one by one. The Habits app will allow users to try on in real time every kind of fashion accessory, such as sunglasses, hats, earrings, watches, sneakers. Because it allows users to explore and try on accessories whenever they are, the Habits app virtually replaces the physical store, reducing brand needs to invest in retail. So thanks to AR technology, we plan to reduce returns and simultaneously boost conversion rates. Um, thanks to our admin panel, fashion brands can register remotely, upload the 3D models of their creation and start selling. If they do not have 3D models, we offer a dedicated service for 3D model creation. Uh, as you can see on this slide, using a 3D model not only enables users to try them through AR, but enormously streamlines the product listing process. Um, brands sell the product through Habits and ship the orders directly. So this way Habits do not need to have a warehouse and just keeps a fee on the order. But what about blockchain? At Habits, we figured out that advertising a fashion product through traditional platform was highly inefficient. As in each step, we were losing more than 90% of our potential customer. Furthermore, the overproduction has made the fashion industry the, the second largest polluting industry and fashion counterfeiting has become an industry on its own. So at Habits, we have created our HBX token that allows fashion brands to launch AD campaigns and obtain guaranteed a augmented reality try-ons. Um, 3D models upload will also require HBX, which in turn means that each product will be, uh, each product upload and evolution will be certified on the blockchain. So the simple formula equals to one HBX token, one guaranteed try-on. And each time a real customer tries on the sponsored product, our smart contract activates. This means that if a brand spends a token, someone actually did try on the product through augmented reality. In fact, investing in an advertising campaign in the Habits ecosystem could be an extremely adventurous alternative to a physical retail investment. At Habits, the protagonist of the brand fashion campaign is directly the potential customer. Um, the HBX tokens also enables fashion brands to start pre-sell campaigns on accessories that haven't been produced yet, just using the 3D model. This way, we are able to fight over production and provide our brand a more stable customer acquisition process. Um, the accessory segment is just a niche, a niche uh, to test the AR technology application in the fashion industry. Um, upon successful feedback in this pilot market, 
uh, we plan to expand into apparel beyond the boundaries of the accessories business uh, with the launch of our, of, of our flagship product, which is the Habits Mirror, which is currently in proof of concept phase. Um, our mirror is planned both for B2B markets such as showrooms and retail stores and for B2C in the very, very, very distant future, making Habits one of the first company to have physical store inside people houses. So currently we are rolling out our iOS beta uh, of the Habits app where you can try uh, sunglasses, hats and earrings, uh, which are real products obtained um, by our commercial efforts. More product type will be added in the next months. And we are also planning to pre-sell our HVAC token through an IO event. And we are actively looking for funds to complete the, the development of the, and the launch of our app within Q4 2020. Um, if you want to try out our iOS uh, only beta, please contact me. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed our product. Thank you so much, Giorgio. And we, I pass on the floor to Ian Fran, co-founder of Ferrum Network, also with a small introduction on the company. Um, yes, hello everybody. Uh, give me a second here. I'm just sharing my screen. Yeah, so um, my name is Ian. I'm the co-founder of Ferrum Network. Ferrum Network is making digital currencies easy for everyday people. So, yeah, I know a lot of you are in the technology space. Some of you are even in the crypto space. I don't know the last time you tried to send money overseas the traditional way through banks but it's a real pain. Um, we, we recently had to send money to our lawyer overseas a couple, uh, a few months ago. It, you know, it takes days and the fees are, you know, I think, I think we paid 30% fees or something outrageous. So, you know, we, we do most of our work in, you know, Tether, Bitcoin, Ethereum, obviously it's a better way to send money around. So my co-founder and I thought, so why, why is this not catching on? Why are people not actually using digital currencies other than to speculate on the price uh, for the most part. I don't want to say only, but for the most part, that's that's all we've been doing for the past 10, 10 or so years. And, and, and we realized, look, from the standpoint of, you know, the lawyer who we sent the money to, she's not tech savvy. She's from an older generation. You know, she's not going to be comfortable sending money. Um, she's not going to be comfortable sending money uh, to a string of letters and numbers, um, to a, you know, to a wallet address, she, she's not going to be comfortable being the custodian of her own money. Um, you know, the backs, her, her, her own backs up writing down a seed phrase and storing it in the drawer. I mean, the, like if, if we, if we can't solve these fundamental problems, we're just going to be speculating on price chart. No one's going to use this stuff other than the really technical or people who are, you know, um, willing willing to take a lot of risks so so we wanted to go back to the drawing board and, and build a product that was extremely user friendly that uh really allows you to send money as easily as easier than a venmo that that takes the risks away from the end user uh with uh, different layers of security and, and so you don't have to be concerned about your seed phrase losing your seed phrase or getting hacked and at the same time not having to turn over all of your privacy and give all the control to a, you know a company like coinbase that that then reports all your transactions to the irs so we we built a wallet um that that solved these problems and i'll get into the um the product features in a moment but you know, the, the wallet address, like the crypto market um, as a whole, is uh, growing um, and it's projected to grow um, many fold uh, over the next few years. And I think maybe the coronavirus uh, pandemic and the financial fallout from that may, may accelerate that trend. I, I think it will. Um, you know, the vast majority, I say vast majority, but a, a large segment of users still just use Coinbase. Um, but there really is no wallet that is a fiat to crypto gateway that also provides the user complete control in a, in a user-friendly way that, that removes some of the risk for them. So there's really no, no mobile non-custodial wallet for new users. And so this is what we've built. We've built, we're sort of calling it the global cash app. It has a number of proprietary technologies behind it. Um, the, the one I'm most excited about is something we're calling link drops. 
basically this allows you to send any digital currency um, using a link. So you just generate the link within the app and then copy and paste that into email, Facebook, Telegram, WhatsApp, um, you're really any community, any uh, chat app you can now send money in. So you don't need to, the recipient doesn't need to send you your wallet address and then you send the money. You can actually send money to someone who's never ever heard of cryptocurrencies before and you can send it to um, to their WhatsApp. Um, so that, that you know, I'm really excited about that feature. I think it, it has a possibility of bringing a lot more people into this world of crypto. Um, I talked about a little about security risk and hacks. That's something that I think a lot of people are concerned about, rightfully so. So we've built um, some uh, so, uh, some more proprietary technology that basically works with Google Cloud and allows you to back up your seed phrase and private keys um, in such a way that if you make a mistake or or if you get hacked, uh, you can still recover your your money, and yet we we as a company uh, can't access any of your information. And the third thing I, that, I, that I think makes this wallet unique compared to some of the other non-custodial wallets is the fact that it, it, it will connect with over 20 fiat currencies around the world, uh, starting with the USD and, and um, uh, the Euro, and then expanding out from there. And uh, we've also, we, we already have a fiat to crypto exchange in Africa that we launched in um, June 2019, that's been growing um, pretty well. It's going to be connected to that as well. And that actually has a bank card with it. So the vision is ultimately to have a bank card connected to your Unifier wallet. Um, we're in talks with Visa now. Hopefully we can get that done. And so not only will you be able to send crypto, buy it, sell it, but you'll also be able to spend it anywhere, right? So the idea is actually able to use this stuff, not just speculate on the price. There's a few different ways we can make money, um, buying and selling uh, uh, each transaction. Every, every time someone buys and sells crypto with fiat, we can, we can move that fee around. Um, debit cards, we already are selling debit cards to the African product. So we're just gonna roll that out for the global product. And then listing fees, um, there's projects already in the pipeline they're interested in listing on, on the wallet. Another thing I'm really excited about is uh, the early response we got from the community. Uh, we really just started marketing this product about a month ago. Um, and last week started the first uh, marketing campaign. And within a couple of days, we got 150,000 people on the uh, wait list. It, many of them were fakes. So we cut it down it, after having, after the program cut it down to the real people, it's 75, oh, probably about 80,000 people now on the wait list for the product. Um, we already had 3,000 on the African app that's growing as well. Um, and, and we have a number of listing partners ready to go. Uh, I touched a bit on, on Coinbase, which is yeah, obviously the biggest player in this space in terms of sort of a user-friendly you know, fiat gateway wallet. But again, they have all your information. You're trusting them not to run away with your money, which obviously haven't done yet. But they also report all your transactions to the IRS. So, you know, you just got to sort of uh, ask yourself is, it, you know, do you want to relinquish that level of control and that level of privacy um, to, to a, a centralized entity? And isn't that sort of antithetical to cryptocurrencies to begin with? And there's a number of other big wallet players out there, none of which have this link drop technology, though, which, again, I think could really change the way we send money around um, because you don't need to send any, there's no wallet address needed anymore. You just send it um, using a link. And I'm, I'm sort of glad we, um, the panel here was talking about coronavirus and the impact on industries. I, I think it's going to have a positive impact in terms of uh, adoption of cryptocurrencies. Um, you know, obviously the U.S. just printed a bunch of money. Uh, I think inflation is probably inevitable. Hyperinflation might be inevitable for some of the uh, you know, less strong economies out there. Um, you see, you know, the searches of Bitcoin going up, happenings coming up. It, it, you know, I, and I think people are going to be looking for an alternative form of money, but they don't, they, they need to be given the tools to make themselves comfortable with it. And so in my stand, from my standpoint, I think the timing is good for a product like this. Um, my background is, is in law, is um, lawyer, big law firms in New York for many years, and then co-founded the blockchain practice team. 
my co-founder, who's sort of the brains of the operation, is a senior engineer, Amazon, Microsoft, Bloomberg. He's PhD. He's pretty, pretty um, uh, smart guy. And we have a whole other, this is just a small segment of the team. We've been at this for almost two years. Um, and I also want to point out Jermaine, who's in Nigeria, running the uh, exchange there. Yeah, Ian, um, your five minutes is far over, so please. Um, oh, just... I'm sorry. Uh, we're not really raising a round right now. We did a round, We did an ICO last year. Um, we raised over a million dollars. We're 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 very frugal. But if people do want to invest, that's the valuation we talked about. Um, I sort of had to slap this deck together quickly after you invited me. And okay, that's all. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ian. And we have one more project, uh, which is represented by uh, Alexander Costa. He is the CTO of uh, Uzis Ecosystem. Alexander, please join. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, pleased to meet you all. Uh, so I'm going to explain a little bit about, about Uzit. Uzit's uh, main goal is to build uh, an online community um, using uh, several products inside one single platform. So our platform uh, I'm going to share here uh, is already developed as we did uh, with, with success a private sale. So uh, our main product blockchain games, market and social. Uh, we are targeting here uh, uh, to build an on online com uh, community and using a referral program uh, so everyone gets benefits the, uh, whenever something does an action on the platform. So if you make an ad on UZ Social, uh, you, you get always, uh, the members are always connected and receive always a percentage of, of the ad everyone that has uh, zitcoins so i'm going to show you a little bit of the of the platform here is our developed platform uh, as you can see uh, we have all, all the products in one single uh, platform we have the uh, network uh, the exchange the games the market and the social as well the chat functionality. So we're just trying to integrate things uh, to for all the users connect whatever the place they are. Some are playing games, some are on the, on the exchange, some are sharing something on uh, social. Uh, and uh, we have developed this UI from scratch uh, and we can switch from social to, for example, the exchange and uh, and keep chatting with our uh, keep messaging with, with everyone on our chat. We are integrating as well our avatar system in our main dashboard. Uh, so we are trying to introduce as well a gamification uh, on the platform. So. It, it keeps the platform a little bit uh, interactive. So we are creating, uh, so every step that you do on the platform, you receive uh, an experience level. So for, for example, you do an ad, you, you receive an, an, an experience. And um, if you make, uh, if you do something on the exchange as well, uh, if you post things on using get uh, coins as well to upgrade your avatar so uh, we are doing all of all of this while uh, sharing uh, revenue for everyone so this uh, for example on the UZ exchange if you have uh, over 1000 zits uh, that it's ERC uh, 20 token uh, you get a 50% discount On the, on, on the crypto industry uh, in regards of using this, uh, our, our own coin to get benefits as well on using social and games. So for the blockchain games, you, you always receive um, 
commissions on, on the on house uh, winnings. So this is a we we wanted to to do an online community, and our main uh, uh, difficulty uh, was because uh, online communities are really hard to get and get a really a strong number there to to keep to everyone inside the platform. So that's why we created several products in one single uh, uh, platform. Uh, this way we can grow and that's why the, the, our main strategy, strategy being the referral program and having benefits by referring friends will be the, op the, the, the best option for us. So people can come in and in a sustainable referral program, this is just uh, a basic referral, uh, you, you, you get people to try and uh, uh, test the platform, basically. Uh, we also are creating some new apps. We created uh, as uh, a Pokemon Go, but instead of Pokemon Go, it's ZitGo. So it's another thing that we built as a product. Uh, so ZitGo, it's catch coins in real life instead of Pokemons. It's already available on the App Store, Apple, and Google Play, as well the Zit Wallet, where you can store all your uh, currency, and it's connected. So your login in the platform will be the, the login for every single thing that we have. So the exchange coins that you have uh, in our platform, when you log in on Zit Wallet, it's the same. It's the same login. You just have to register once, and then the, uh, everyone can uh, uh, use everything that it's available online. So this is uh, mainly what we are trying to achieve, and uh, we are updating right now our website to start our official ICO, so we can upgrade all of these products. So. Uh, the main thing is this, and uh, just one last thing is the we are using as a, a Zitcoin as well as a shareholder uh, type of token, as we are trying to to make everything open and in smart contract, so everyone everyone can see uh, the real uh, winnings of the the platform, and then it's distributed by Zitcoin. So if you have more Zitcoins, the more you receive, and that's it. That's how we are trying to market, and that's uh, Zitcoin, basically. Uh, a coin to help us build an online community with a one single ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So now uh, we are going to our Q&A session and I will introduce you two of our judges who will also join our investor panel. And um, uh, one of them is Ibrahim Akurt, uh, a founding partner of uh, Levalier Capital uh, Management. And um, could you briefly also introduce you, uh, yourself, Ibrahim, and uh, say a couple of words on the performance of our today's teams Sure. Hi, guys. Uh, thank you for pitching. Uh, thanks for everyone that's watching. So my name is Ibrahim al -Kurd. I'm the CEO of New Mine and also one of the founding uh, partners of Lavale Capital Management. We are a cryptocurrency hedge fund based out of um, Palm Beach in Florida. We mainly do um, digital asset investments, cryptocurrency investments. Uh, in Q4 of 2019, we were actually the top performing cryptocurrency hedge fund in the industry. Um, I think overall, um, really good on the on the pitching. I particularly liked, I made some notes because there's a lot to remember, but I particularly liked uh, Habits and, and Firm. I think your uh, both projects are genuinely going out there to fix a genuine problem. You know, with regards to the retail industry, um, I, I hate shopping. I think a lot of people don't really like it. And I think the problem with shopping is that um, there isn't enough technology in it. So it's very laborious and difficult process. So um, trying to tackle that is definitely great. Um, the points that Firm hit on, the fact that Right now, we um, there is not enough adoption of cryptocurrency because it's difficult for the average person to access. You know, for me, I find it very easy, but that's because I've been in the industry now for five years. I probably had some difficulties five years ago. I did have some difficulties, you know, getting into it. Uh, so I think both projects have a genuine need. 
But what I'd say to all of the um, projects that I've pitched today is you need to provide a genuine uh, value proposition if you're going to be offering a utility token. Don't just offer a utility token that's not going to be useful because you're going to do bad by your investors and you're going to not be able to raise future rounds. I think that part of the reason that a lot of the uh, cryptocurrency projects, the ICO ones have failed is because they didn't provide a genuine useful utility for their tokens. And that's why we're seeing uh, more of an interest in, in securitized tokens. Um, so that's kind of my overall view. Um, I think that, you know, some of the things we talked about that um, the, the world is moving through, uh, is going through a digital direction, right? The internet is 30 years old, but it's caused such a massive impact on our society and it's going to continue to do so. And, um, you know, what we'll find is that within the next decade, remote work is going to become more and more popular. In the last 10 years in the US, um, remote workers have gone up by 90%. We're going to see a similar trend in the next 10 years. It's going to increase even more. So I think that this pandemic is definitely highlighting that, um, you know, people have to start learning to work a bit more remotely because, um, there are a lot of advantages to having a decentralized team. One of the one of them being that uh, you can hire some of the best people from all over the world without needing to be restricted by people that are within your city. Uh, so yeah, those are those are kind of my initial thoughts, and I pass this back to you, Nadia. Uh, thank you so much, Abraham, and uh, I pass the floor also to Maher Chebo, Senior Executive uh, Chief Commercial uh, of Innovation uh, Center Digital Energy GE Power. Uh, also to introduce yourself in a couple of words and represent your views on the um, elevated pitches about today's participants. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, so uh, thanks for the presentations. I think the uh, all presenters had uh, a, a good pitch. Uh, uh, good effort was uh, put on the uh, um, explanation of the offer and then uh, explaining why is that innovative. There is innovation in every one of them. Uh, I like the fashion as well because it's, uh, it's, it speaks to everyone. It's simple. Uh, however, I was lacking at the end the uh, evaluation of the business uh, behind it. Uh, the market, yes, is huge. We know that everybody is shopping. Uh, but there was uh, no numbers at the end uh, to explain how we could address the market and how much business we could make out of it. Uh, the one that I have seen very complete and actually uh, probably because he, Ian uh, friend took uh, more time than the others is the firm network. Uh, there is uh, uh, a market particularly with what's going on today and the COVID and uh, the uh, trillion of uh, dollars that the uh, uh, U.S., for example, is uh, issuing. Uh, there is uh, a, a thinking about the inflation and what's going on in the world and uh, what the European Union also is doing, what every country is doing with this crisis, which touched about 180 countries in the world. And if you have like a technology which can make it simpler to involve everyone and makes it simpler as well for the emerging countries, and could be an alternative uh, and uh, could be more stable than uh, the uh, normal currency. Uh, I think that could be interesting to explore. Now, of course, uh, the blockchain is not a uh, uh, straightforward technology. Uh, of course, we need to dig more and see uh, the overall offering here and how attractive is that. Uh, but the numbers that were presented showed that well, there was uh, 75,000 on the waiting list. Uh, so uh, I think it's worth looking with what's going on in the world today, worth looking at this and exploring a bit more. Uh, I understood that the business uh, doesn't require even fundraising, but in case uh, they could uh, get the support that was mentioned at the end, which is not millions that they are talking about. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Yes. Um, um, who would like to also, while uh, all the judges are filling in uh, their evaluation forms, um, maybe team, would you like to say a couple of words about uh, the beach session? Do you have any questions or maybe uh, brief input uh, on the performance of our today's panelists? I do, actually. Okay, Ben. Take a poll. Uh, sure. Um, so I did have. Well, so I, I do see a lot of startups. Um, I do. Um, see, Sorry, I'm unmuted. Go ahead. My apologies. I 
I, I said I do see a lot of startups and um, I have seen variations of everyone's uh, startups in, in some form today. And um, like, especially the, the most recent one on the, uh, I guess the Pokemon Go for collecting coins. I don't see what wh where what business model um, there is. I mean, aside from someone just downloading coins or getting coins, you know what what is what is the actual value? Um, wh why would people download this? And and what I guess what value do the coins have? It doesn't sound like the, the coins have any real value um, aside from people um, you know tossing money at it in a pyramid scheme uh, like fashion. Um, and then, and then the one specifically on the AR uh, fashion um, platform, there are so many different AR fashion apps out there. I know Zara has uh, launched something similar for, um, within um, the, within their store for their customers. And um, I'm guessing I'm just trying to understand what the value proposition is for a lot of these companies. I, I just don't see um, how it's different from. Uh, you know, from a lot of what's currently out there. Um, uh, the difference between habits and the the Zara application you were you were talking you were talking about earlier is that Zara is uh, um, a single brand uh, retailer and retailer, uh, so they can translate into into three D models their own products and they sell their own products. Habits is uh, pointed towards independent designers. Um, which have zero opportunity to um, emerge in this uh, very, very big ocean, which is, which is the multi-brand uh, e-commerces. And right now, there, there are very, very few tools for independent designers that want to uh, go digital, go 100% 3D. And uh, that's what Habits is designed for. So um, our value proposition is, most, is more shifted through independent designers and uh, a small team which want to uh, validate the possibility to, uh, to, to launch their own e-commerce or to launch their own, uh, their own fashion startup. And we help them build their online presence. We help them uh, uh, create the, their 3D models and we help them uh, obtain their uh, uh, visibility in our own platform. So that, that is the difference between, for example, what is Gucci doing or what is Zara doing. They are single brands, so they already have the base, they already have their application, and they're selling only their products. So Abits is more for selling other people products, which are small teams and independent designers. Okay, thank you so much, Giorgio. And Abraham, he also had a question to Ian. Yeah, um, so yeah, my question is, um, obviously there's been a lot of money pumped into the market, uh, you know, billions of dollars. There's a lot of very wealthy companies, well, you know, Coinbase, et cetera, Binance, et cetera. Why do you think that they have not been very successful in increasing the ease of uh, adoption of cryptocurrency by the average retail buyer? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I mean, they obviously do have massive war chests and Coinbase is doing its part in terms of education and, you know, you can take courses that reward you in tokens if you learn about the uh, ecosystem and, and things of that nature. And their apps are user friendly. I mean, there's, but, but I still think they're, they're missing a few key components. Um, one, those, you know, those two entities you talked about are, are just that they're entities. You are trusting them. That that's not the real ethos. That's not the goal. I think of, of uh, this ecosystem. Um, ultimately we want people to be the custodians of their own money, um, but the non-custodial wallets that uh, have been built thus far, I think are far too technically challenging um, and they put far too much risk on the end user. So, I mean, look, Coinbase, uh, Binance, uh, they're gonna be there um, and they're gonna be pushing the industry forward and obviously what CZ and, and um, Brian Armstrong do, I, I salute those guys. But they have a bit of a different uh, business model. They've, I think, a, they're taking the industry in a direction that I'm not sure we want it to go. Um, you know, do we want in five years from now the only two companies to be Coinbase and Binance, um, or do we want some options out there? We want to give users control of their money. So, um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see where where things go the next few years. Um, I hope it it sort of moves away from the direction of those two sucking up all the oxygen out of the room. 
but we'll see. I mean, we, we launched in Africa and then, um, uh, CZ came to Nigeria, you know, four months later. <laughs> I mean, they're everywhere. They, they're, they're doing everything. So uh, it's tough. There's no doubt about it. But I still think there's room for um, a number of different competitors out there. And, and we're trying to offer our unique value proposition. And so far, um, our community and our users are, are um, I think, uh, uh, appreciating what we do. Okay, thank you very much, Ian. Uh, we have uh, all the evaluation forms completed already. So maybe a couple of words from Tim and Nick uh, also to summarize uh, the story. Yeah, a couple of thoughts, just general thoughts on all of the presentations um, from substance and form. Uh, first of all, I understand language is to some extent a barrier, but reading something to an audience is not compelling. So don't. Uh, secondly, I'd reinforce what a couple of the other commentators have said. This is, we're, we're all capitalists here. We may have a libertarian bent, some of us, right? But we're all capitalists here. So you have to really explain why someone should put money in your project. Ultimately, it's to make more. It always is. Uh, to make more in the short term, to make more in the long term. So if you're marketing a utility token, what is driving price formation? I wrote an article about two years ago now on the seven drivers of price formation and ICOs. ICOs are obviously dead, but the, the concepts, the principles remain mainly because I took those, most of those seven points from investing in, in fiat, doing C, V, C, and P investing in the fiat space, which I've done a lot of. So you, you should focus less in your presentation on what you're doing and and I don't mean to say you should explain it. I just mean people get involved and this is what we're doing. This is our team. This is what we're producing. This is the problem. That's nice, right? And it's also fairly obvious. But if you're really going to do a persuasive presentation, you need to do the presentation and look at it from the point of view of the person you're giving the presentation to. And too many people, most people, almost everyone in the startup community focuses on themselves too much and Honestly, it's not just true of the startup community, but that's what I really noticed in these presentations. Um, someone said, I just threw this together. Even if that's true, never admit that, right? I mean, you, you need to focus, you need to look professional because you're making a first impression on all of us. You only get one chance to make a first impression as the, as the aphorism goes. Remember that. So as a general rule, focus on your presentations more from the standpoint of what the recipient the listener wants and is expecting, unless on yourself. Uh, thank you so much, Tim and Nick. A couple of words from you. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good uh, summary, Tim, actually. Um, so I'm not going to repeat any of that. Um, individually, um, I raised quite a lot of capital for a number of supply chain plays. Um, so Comtrade, I think you're missing some fundamental tricks of the trade here. You know, supply chain is all about removing friction time cost. And um, yeah, supply chain is a fantastic, it's a native natural area for blockchain. And I didn't hear it mentioned um, too much, if at all. Um, retail, again, the biggest, the biggest uh, business case here is, is what I hear is returns. I mean, Amazon's returns 50 billion a year. I and mean, would you believe? Uh, in my family businesses, we, uh, we have a retail arm, um, an online fashion, and the bugbear is reta returns. Um, but there's a lot of people doing avatar-based stuff, 4K. Um, a lot of people like shopping, a lot of people hate shopping, and we're being pushed to the periphery now, aren't we? So I didn't really get, you know, I really didn't get the HBX token and why you need it, actually, is fundamentally. Um, Ferrum, I... Look, I own an exchange. We do 20 currencies. Uh, we trade gold, which is a gold token, which is issued by the US Mint. So it's a currency. We've got 80 billion in liquidity. Liquidity is the, the lifeblood of anything to do with wallets. We, we get involved with hot and cold wallets. We get involved in custody. We, we work globally. I don't, I don't see anything unique about what you're doing, I'm afraid. And... Um, it's a very challenging area and you need money services license left, right and centre. You need permissions to do things, you know, and you're moving into some fairly, I hope you've got good lawyers to advise you. Um, and then the last one, I didn't understand, to be honest, maybe it's because I'm an old guy, but I just didn't understand 
what 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 problem we're solving why are you doing it what what who wins who loses what's the what's the opportunity um so yeah i you know i know you've only got five minutes and as tim said and listen to what tim said is is you know why should we put capital into you you know what problem are you solving what's the solution you know but people people get comfort from you know momentum and traction you know are you you know where are you uh, in the market and what progress are you making um a lot of you mentioned about proof of concepts mvps as investors i don't want to invest in a software development program it's too risky i want to invest in a, in a project i'll give you an example so uh, my business partner and i invested in a business called sweatcoin sweatcoin is a utility token free download app that rewards you for walking to the pub so it's 75 million users in three years and it's a voucher system and it's a very clear business case i own sweat coins i walk the dog and can spend them on the nike store and get some cheap trainers there you go keep it simple that's it uh thank you very much nick and uh, we have just a couple of minutes so maybe ashton and tess or could you also share your views ashton could you start yes thank you so much nadia uh thank you to the speakers with what limited time uh, you had uh, I'll try to not take up too much of your time and repeat uh, what Tim said, but I really wanted to emphasize the fact that uh, having uh, an understandable, you know, defensible intellectual property, you know, and what makes your application different than competitors uh, and something that you can back up with either a patent or some kind of intellectual property is definitely key. Um, and also just the specific integration into the traditional industry you know, how are you specifically integrating that's going to allow <clears throat> users to majorly adopt uh, with Comtrade? <clears throat> it seemed uh, <clears throat> sort of, <clears throat> pardon me, seems sort of promising, uh, but I'd like to see on the integration process, you know, what is the pilot? What are the first commodities that are coming on and, and how efficient has that actually worked uh, once we get past the concept stage on uh, with habits? Um, I thought you know, AR is definitely a great opportunity. Um, I was uncertain about the token model and <clears throat> seeing the, uh, you know, a try on, I would, I would expect more uh, for the token model to be integrated either with uh, something to do with discounts or with the actual purchasing process rather than a try on. And I think maybe narrowing down more of uh, the augmented reality to, to a feature that you can sell to something like Amazon or a multi retailer, um, because of course, everyone's using Amazon because it delivers super fast, the margins are super great and the prices are great. Um, so it's very hard to compete with somebody like that or Etsy, for example, if you're going to more boutique designers or, or, or on the artist side. Um, Ferrum Network, uh, I really do like the uh, ability to transfer through the links. Um, although it's not really a defensible IP, it's more of a feature. Um, there are many competitors, you know, FIO and Unstoppable Domains. I know FIO is already doing integrations with Binance and cryptocurrency exchanges. Um, so to see how you could overtake those guys would be would be great. And uh, I'm, I'm interested more in how the developed countries would be able to adopt this technology. You know, I know it's very easy for um, people that aren't using traditional banking systems in Africa to jump on, uh, but how is this going to get the everyday users in North America to start uh, trading currencies. That would be my question for them. And um, the Uzith platform, it was definitely way too busy, uh, too many things. They really need to focus on one of the projects, right? You know, it's hard to run a cryptocurrency exchange and a game and a social network uh, when those are all different businesses. So they really need to uh, hone down and narrow down the application, I think, uh, because there are competitors in all of those industries. So that, that narrowing that focus would be great. And otherwise, uh, great job with with uh, the time that you guys had. Uh, thank you so much, Ashton and Tess. Could you also briefly outline all the projects in just a couple of minutes? Thank you. Uh, your mic is off, uh, Tess. Could you please? Yeah. Thanks. Hi, yes, thank you. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to keep it short. I agree with a lot of the great points that the other judges have shared. Um, I think 
I hope everyone took good notes on this. Having said that, though, I understand that it's a five minute pitch and um, everyone's trying their best. So I'm just going to take another side of this where I think um, it is important that we all try to solve the pain points of things that we care about and what is our domain expertise. Um, in this scenario, I think uh, each team, you know, I'm sure each founder tried their best and iteration is most important. Uh, so I think the next time with all the great feedback, everyone will do a great job. For me personally, uh, I really believe um, FinTech was something that I always invested in. And that was what I was investing in equity uh, before blockchain cryptocurrency really was able to come into the world. So four years ago, blockchain and crypto was my key focus as soon as it became more evident. And I knew a lot of the leaders within the ecosystem that was able to validate this. And uh, DeFi products is absolutely you know, a very big focus that um, the world needs to look at and that's the best you know right now one of the best startup and area for entrepreneurs to disrupt which blockchain essentially is technology at the intersection of technology meaning wall street so that's why i think um you know all the projects you know it was a good attempt all the judges what they have said is very relevant i think i'll just highlight for firm network i think while it is hard what you're doing and what the company is doing but i think if we think about fundamentally why blockchain has not picked up like the way internet has is because of the barrier for mass adoption. So I really would love to encourage more founders to try and solve areas, solve pain points in that area. And I think, you know, everyone's contributing to it. So Ferrum Network is trying, I think, you know, for your team, you're trying your best to come up with the lock address concept. Um, I agree. It is a feature more than um, yeah, defensibility, but the products of being able to roll out something that's easier in the hands of consumers where you try to build something within the ecosystem that gets there uh, is important. So right now there's already over uh, obviously a dozen different uh, you know, what they call you know debit cards that are on the market, um, namely, you know, um, 10x, Moek, uh, you know, obviously you said Coinbase, and also, of course, uh, Binance is rolling out something too. Um, and Revolut has done a great job. So a company that's from UK, everyone's trying their, you know, approach. And I think, you know, definitely um, being in the emerging market is, you know, uh, very uh, needed right now, because I also focus on Latin. Latin America and also Southeast Asia and a little bit in Africa. So that's where FinTech is probably going to be first tested with blockchain and crypto. So I encourage definitely to continue to iterate, continue to look to see how you can help with mass adoption and making it user friendly for people to be able to actually purchase crypto, which is the fiat gateway, uh, fiat to crypto gateway, which is so continuously as an investor, I'm looking for teams that can really come up with um, real tangible solutions for this. So definitely, I think, um, you know, Fair Network and all the other teams keep doing what you're doing. I definitely wanted to leave this on a positive note for everyone. Thank you so much, Tess. And um, we have our winner already. So, um, the first place goes to Giorgio Guidetti, Chief Technology Officer, Founder of Habits. So big applause to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. And the second place is uh, Ian Friend, co-founder of uh, Ferrum Network. Thank you. Big applause to you as well. And um, so this is the end of our today's panel discussion. And uh, uh, you can exchange uh, uh, contacts uh, and uh, ask your further questions through Yelena, our host for today. And um, if uh, investors still have questions to you and are interested in your projects, they will contact you directly through Yelena. Uh, and uh, thank you very much to all. If uh, uh, anybody would like to uh, say a couple of uh, farewell words, maybe some of your associations to today's topics, discussions in one or two words. Uh, what uh, comes up to your mind as a metaphor for today? Nick? I think this is a good, uh, a good format. And I know that um, you're going to be running several of these. Um, and I do also know that pitching in five minutes is, um, is very, very hard when you put on the spot. But it's... Um, you know, you need to do more of these. Just practice, practice, practice. Um, it is enjoyable. You do get used to it. Um, you've got some good people on this uh, on this call. Uh, also, the follow-up's important. So, um, yeah, I think it's a good session. Thank you, team. 
learning to unmute more rapidly here. No, it's a, it's a, I think it's a good general discussion. The, I, again, I would like to see perhaps a, a bit more, uh, no, I'd definitely like to see more direct points and a good summary of, uh, particularly in terms of the investment cases, why invest? Uh, perfect. Just one word association from uh, Ashton. I think um, Nick and Tim said it well. Just keep going and uh, keep, you know, the more that, that you do, uh, the more pitches you do, the more you can refine it. Uh, you know, if and uh, if you can just do it for friends and family or do it, do it for uh, your colleagues and uh, mock mock pitches, I think you can nail down five minutes is perfect. You know, investors are short on time and uh, a five minute pitch, uh, the perfect five minute pitch can be perfected. It just takes uh, grinding it out. Really, it's the only way to do it. Thank you. Thank everybody. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ben. Um, yeah. The only thing that I really have to add is um, I, I, I think a lot of the pitches still need a lot of work. Um, I think a lot of the pitches, um, you know, I think practice makes perfect. Um, practicing with, you know, uh, attending other pitch events. Um, a lot of them have gone virtual uh, because of, of, of the coronavirus. So there's no shortage of events that you can you can attend and, and, and pitch to. Um, you'll definitely get a lot of different feedback from uh, a, a diverse group of people. So uh, I highly encourage all of you to keep working on your pitches. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, Maher? So uh, I think this is a, a good uh, exercise, even if we do it face-to-face uh, -face in a physical meeting, uh, when it's really quick, uh, it's always you know challenging uh, to pass the point. My my advice is uh, three things: is first, you know, understand who is the audience. Second, is make it very simple in presenting and go straight to the point. One, two, three. Why is that different? Where is the business? Where is the market? And three is uh, always keep improving the follow up and improving and getting in new ideas every time you present it is really key. Uh, thank you very much. And Tess, just a word from you. Thank you. I would like to conclude with saying that uh, while this, uh, you know, this chaos is the new normal, um, and with all chaos comes opportunities. So everyone should keep doing what they're doing. And I think bringing on um, great advisors or utilizing your advisors and practice with them, help them get it down to something that you feel really uh, proud of and actually feel um, if you were an investor, you would actually invest in, uh, even if it's a five minute pitch, even if it's a 30 second pitch, I absolutely always say to my founders is, have your 30 second pitch ready because it is an elevator pitch. Sometimes you just have one shot to get a meeting. So practice that and uh, you know ask other people for feedback, iterate it in private, and then definitely do the public uh, pitches. Yeah. Good luck, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for being with us tonight. And um, we'll keep on with this format. Get ready, all the participants. And thank you very much, our judges and investors, for being with us and uh, training our projects, being more um, in sharp communication with you and being straight to the point. And uh, now for all the projects and investors, you can get in touch directly if you have any uh, more interest uh, to, to each other. And if there are any questions uh, you didn't ask during the Q&A. Thank you very much and uh, good luck, everybody. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. Thanks, Nadia. Well done. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Nadia. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.